in brain he said uh, heart is a seat of the soul not the brain what does that mean uh, by soul what they mean is what is the part of the part of you the body right which gives you a sense of self and makes you conscious and all that stuff so he thought the heart is uh, that organ not the brain and uh, so one reason one way you can justify this is that right even uh, when the heart stops everything stops i mean everything is in a shutdown whereas with brain it's not like that a person can be brain dead and still if the heart is functioning the body can be kept alive so maybe these are the considerations that made uh, i start to think that uh, heart is it also then this guy called hero filus so he said uh, he is considered to be father of experimental medicine method in medicine uh so he said ventricles are the seat of the soul so there are in the brain there are these cavities these fluid filled cavities called the ventricles right and this guy felt that uh, they must be the seat of the soul and which is very strange because there's nothing there it's just a cavity then much more recently right this is in our renaissance period about 500 years ago Leonardo da Vinci who is considered the renaissance man the key figure in renaissance he was known for his mona lisa painting and all that but he was also a great scientist he did a lot of studies in engineering and even in anatomy he was studying anatomy because as an artist he needs to draw human figures and he needs to be able to have uh, you know uh, an accurate understanding of uh, human figures so for that purpose he would actually buy uh, corpses of people who were executed you know the criminals who were executed right he would buy those corpses and bring them to his studio and dissect them and uh, study the human shape the body shape of the human body in great detail so he did a lot of anatomical studies in that process and studied for example uh, you know how fetus uh, is in you know, is curls up inside the womb of a pregnant woman and you know the anatomy of the heart and brain and so on he had good understanding of you know the gross anatomy of the brain the locations of the ventricles and things like that so uh, <coughs> so thing is so but leonardo also uh, believed that uh, ventricles are the seat of the soul for some reason this idea has been there for and for millennia the idea that somehow something magical is present inside the ventricles so people kept on going you know kind of when it comes to uh, the understanding of the anatomy of the brain people had a reasonable understanding for a long time because that's a simpler problem you just you know cut open the brain of a dead man and then you can see what are the parts what is there inside the brain but to understand brain function how does it work and how is it active how does it produce thoughts and all these things requires a whole different right a body of science which was not present in the antiquity so people were guessing wildly right so the, so you see that uh, people are okay when it comes to understand anatomical understanding but totally off the mark when it came comes to understanding of function and especially these religious ideas about soul and you know spirit and all that kept in interfering with our understanding of science so that was a big obstacle for a long time and during renaissance period you know all these new ideas were coming you know people were getting in the entering this period of enlightenment uh, so there was a need to put an end to this religious interference with uh, you know with science and that came in the in this very interesting uh, kind of theory or proposal by rene descartes right you know descartes you know from your cartesian geometry and analytical geometry uh, so he had a very interesting idea he said that uh, right god exists and soul exists and all that but god created the universe and once he is created he stepped back and after that the universe is continues to run by certain natural laws and this god doesn't stick his finger in every phenomenon so you don't need to in, invoke god at every step right uh, i said that but uh, when it comes to uh, explaining for example the process of reflex action so suppose when you touch something hot you reflexively withdraw your hand right you don't even have to think and you know analyze that process so how does it happen so this is what uh, descartes said he said that external motions affect the peripheral ends of the nerve fibrils which in turn displays the central ends and as central ends are displaced the pattern of interfibrillar space is rearranged and the flow of animal spirits is thereby directed into the appropriate nerves so he is basically trying to give a physical explanation of how reflex action works he was reasonable up to a point but suddenly he also is he came under the influence of this animal spirits and things like that so so basically he's saying something when you touch something hard you know something goes through the nerve fibers and then some there's some displacement everything is vague because he doesn't have real understanding of the microanatomy 
and then he says that some kind of animal spirits right which is again a religious idea uh, thereby is you know rushes through your hand and then moves your hand away from the from the fire so like that there is a mixture of scientific ideas and you know superstitious beliefs for a long time so then there was another uh, interesting uh, study which was completely unscientific but actually kind of gave a direction towards a more scientific study of brain this was called phrenology uh, phrenos is mind and logos is you know science so it's study of mind this this austrian physician and uh, anatomist neuroanatomist called franz gall he had with this very interesting idea right he is he basically these guys you know this phrenologist would would uh, kind of uh, feel the surface of the brain and uh, tell the character of a individual and what is the logic behind that uh, so that he says the brain is an organ of the mind okay so that is kind of you can accept that and mind is composed of multiple distinct faculties so mind has lots of you know, you know faculties or properties characteristics each faculty has a separate organ in the brain yes uh, so far so good because there is a region for vision there is a region for sound processing there is a region for uh, you know processing touch and so on so so far so good but that's not what this guy is driving at the size of the organ is a measure of its power okay so here is going off of of the charts already and the size of various organs determine the shape of the brain okay and the shape of the brain determines uh, the shape of the skull which is completely you know inaccurate and the surface of the skull is an accurate indicator uh, or an index of uh, psychological aptitudes and tendencies okay so what is driving it is suppose a person has many many qualities you know uh, verbal you know proficiency or kindness and generosity and envy and short temperedness whatever you have lots of characteristics what gall is saying is each of these characteristics has a certain seat like a, like a like a base inside the brain and which itself is a, now starts you know, it's becoming slightly questionable because where, what is the base of generosity in the brain there's no such thing okay there's a base for uh, or a seat for visual system or visual processing right but there's nothing like a base for generosity or you know friendship and things like that which is which is but is a very abstract so but he assumed that and then he thought each the each of them has a part in the brain and then so when the and if this quality is 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 great in a given person the corresponding brain region must be very large and therefore these large brain areas keep pushing from inside in, into the skull right and therefore that part of the skull becomes a kind of expanded this is a, which is quite absurd actually so therefore by just feeling the bumps on your head right uh, you can uh predict the character of a person which is quite absurd and but like you know like palmistry and astrology all these things they were also very popular and they were making a lot of money and that was a lot of concern for people so it was an unscientific idea but uh, it led to something quite interesting much later so let us see what it is uh so um now let us see how the, the developments in various branches of science right uh, like anatomy and embryology and physiology pharmacology psychology all these have led to a more modern and contemporary understanding of the brain so let us start with anatomy so like i was saying uh, descartes have tried to explain the process in terms of some kind of animal spirits and fluids rushing through you know these fibers inside the hand and things like that so this fluid idea you find in lots of ancient uh, or old ideas about in science like people thought there is this thing called ether which filled the entire universe and you know all the planets are moving inside the ether and with einstein this ether idea is shot down okay similarly people thought that uh, heat is also some kind of a fluid right but with better understanding of uh, uh, classical uh, statistical mechanics and all that right that idea is also shot down so the, slowly in even in case of uh, you know the brain and brain understanding this fluid idea slowly got shot down let us see how it happened so because people thought you know, all the work of the brain is done by these fluids right inside the brain or flowing through this uh, brain these fibers no fibers uh, so people thought that inside the brain this the tissue is, is in the form of a reticulum what's called a reticulum some kind of a network right we know that brain is a network of neurons but this is not the in the sense in which they were describing brain as a network they describe it as what is called a syncytial network okay what does that mean let us see this 
So these are the cells inside, inside the brain, or at least this is what they were imagining long ago. And you see that uh, there is a continuous corridor going from one cell to another. So there is a passage, all right? Uh, that kind of network is called a sensation. So for example, the heart tissue is that kind of network. Heart is a sensation. So people thought that brain is also sensation. And why do you need to assume that? Because if you want a fluid to flow all the way from the cells inside the brain to your hand, you need to have a continuous corridor. Otherwise, how will fluid flow? So people thought that all the cells inside the brain form a kind of continuous corridor, a sensation like this. But uh, that idea was uh, shot down, and that motivation came from studies of uh, Camillo Golgi, right? Uh, who did uh, so? The thing is, brain. If you take brain slices, uh, you can't really find neurons even if you look at in microscope because neurons are almost transparent. So you need to stain the tissue, and that staining techniques. Uh, one of the first staining techniques was developed by Camillo Golgi, right? Which is now even now used apparently by you know, by experimental biologists. So uh, Golgi's the silver impregnation method, right? Allowed visualization of the anatomy, and this is actually uh, you won't believe it. This is actually a hand-drawn picture of hippocampus, a slice of hippocampus drawn by Golgi. So in this picture, you can see these small black dots, uh, which are neurons. Okay, uh, so seeing these kinds of uh, Golgi uh, stains, right, of, uh, and uh, studying lots of different uh, brain tissues, so slices of brain tissue. Uh, Ramon E. Cajal is a Spanish uh, you know, neuroscientist, right? He proposed what is called a neuron doctrine. What does the doctrine say? That the nervous system is made up of individual elements uh, or cells called neurons which contact one another only at specialized points of interaction called synapses. So he is not saying that neurons form a sensation, right? They are saying it's not a sensation, but they come together, neurons come together, you know, at these junction points called synapses. At the synapse, there is the neuron, the cell ends, there's a clear border, there is, there's no continuous corridor connecting one cell to another. Okay, so that was the neuron doctrine, and uh, you know, that was a major uh, step in our understanding of the brain, especially at the microscopic level. Right? So these are some of the pictures drawn by Ramoni Kahal using Golgi's staining technique. So these are uh, pyramidal cells, one of the most commonly uh, you know, existing type of neurons in the brain. These are Purkinje cells, uh, a very interesting kind of cell found in cerebellum. Purkinje cells are very ornate. They have these large arbors. So one thing that is very striking about a neuron compared to any other cell is this wiry stuff sticking out of the cell. Uh, no other cell in the body has that kind of wiring uh, sticking out of the cell body. You know, especially in that sense. So this is a typical uh, neuron. So you have the cell body here in the center, right? And then you have wires uh, coming out on both sides. And so on one side, you have typically, this is a typical feature, but neurons come in all sorts of sizes and shapes and morphologies. But typically, on one side, you have a shorter set of fibers. Uh, these are called dendrites. On the other side, you have typically one long fiber extending out and then branching out. All right. Uh, so this long fiber is called an axon. And the branches are called you know, axon collaterals or branches of axons. Right, and at the tip of the axon, right, one neuron makes contact, the axon of one neuron makes contact with the dendrite of another neuron, right, and that junction point is called a synapse, right, so they loop closes. So you say so neuron receives signals from another neuron at the dendrites. These signals flow through the cell, flow through the dendrites and reach the cell body. And then they go beyond the cell body, go through the axon, and then go, then at the axon, at the tip of the axon, they make contact, there is a synapse, and the synapse, they, the signals jump over to another neuron, and so on and so forth. So this is, so this is how it works, but all this was worked out much later. So now if you look at the, the questions about functional organization, so that is, uh, how are various functions distributed in the brain? How does brain perform all its functions? What, which, what part of the brain does what function? So here again, uh, phrenology was again quite uh, useful. It was a good uh, guiding principle. Although phrenology was wrong, essentially, it was a good guiding principle. <coughs> because what happened was phrenology was becoming very popular, and uh, so and that and in France, the, the Emperor Napoleon heard about all this phrenology business. He didn't he didn't like it at all because he felt it's very unscientific. There's no basis to it. 
and napoleon was a great uh, you know votary of science and he wanted uh, to promote scientific temperament in his empire and so on so he called uh, this guy you know called uh, pierre florence jean pierre florence right a uh, french uh, you know, scientist and said you know it pretty up this all technology and also i don't like it right you do some experiments and find out exactly what's happening so what florence did uh, is he has taken the experimental animals so he would actually remove different parts of the brains of these animals and study their behavior in the in the laboratory which is far better than what neurologists have done because they didn't have any evidence at all so when he did that what uh, pierre florence found is that uh, mental functions are not localized so if you remove one part of the brain of an animal you don't see a very specific uh, change in its behavior right and it, it so so you will so only see a very general degradation in its function okay so uh, that's what he called uh, aggregate field view so what he was saying is the exact locational damage doesn't matter it's only the overall extent of the damage that's what matters right this is called, uh, this is called ag aggregate field view but now we know that uh, this is not a very accurate description either because first of all he was making very crude uh, you know lesions and anatomical injuries uh, to the animal's brain and also with animal how much can you study if animal doesn't talk you know it doesn't do any he didn't train them or anything the way you people train animals to do you know perform uh, functions in the in the in modern neuroscience research so he was uh, there was some truth in it but it was, they were not very uh, precise experiments so later on british neurologist right huglings jackson he was studying patients with uh, focal epilepsy so epilepsy is a, is a brain uh, disease where suddenly brain gets into a seizure the seizure basically is characterized by uh, a large, large brain wide in activity involving you know large synchronized oscillations of you know of neural neural activity so when this happens the person loses consciousness and can even lose balance and fall on the ground and you know they can seize they can be they can undergo convulsions or what is more popularly called fits right and uh, in in this kind of focal epilepsy uh, seizures uh, the convulsions spread from one part of the body and start from one part of the body and spreads uh, to different parts of the body and usually it spreads to all over the body and the spreading pattern is always the same this is what uh, huglings jackson observed so usually in one kind of seizure the the this kind of convulsions start from the fingers from fingers this they go to the elbow from el you know elbow up to the wrist and wrist to the elbow and wrist and elbow to the shoulder and then occupies the entire abdomen and they they lose balance after that so when he saw this pattern of spreading you know, huglings jackson has a brilliant idea he said that uh, the different parts of the body are probably controlled by precise locations in different parts of the brain and these locations are probably close to each other right for example if you look at uh, and this is actually proven to be true later but so he he had something like this in in mind so if you look at this this is a this is a part of the brain that controls your movements okay so uh, so this part controls your thumb this part controls your middle finger this part controls your ring finger this part controls your hand this part controls wrist and so on and so forth so basically what is happening is when a seizure starts an abnormal activity of the neurons start in one place and from there it's spreads to neighboring regions like a forest fire you know, fire spreads in a forest right so this activity spreads to from region to region to neighboring regions and uh, so therefore when the activity starts here the maybe this thumb starts shaking when it spreads to the hand the whole hand starts shaking when it spreads to the wrist the wrist starts shaking and so on and so forth so this is what he visualized he didn't have this kind of idea about you know how brain is structured but he was it was just a guess and he was very insightful it was uh, he was he was on the right track okay which was uh, you know kind of confirmed much later by uh, anatomical brain mapping studies so similarly other evidence came from uh, other sources so again french neurologist called paul uh, broca right he was studying a patient who did not uh, understand uh, could understand language but could not speak he had some kind of a speech problem right first of all for the one of the first patients who was studied by broca is, is the, that guy could utter only one word tan he could only say tan right so in fact they named him tan because of that so uh, but uh, if you look at other uh, kind of patients right one patient uh, could uh, when he tried to talk it looks something like this sun university smart boy good good 
basically what is trying to say you can easily guess is that he has son he goes to university and is a smart boy and is a good boy right but he could not frame complete sentences you know with uh, with a structure and grammar and all that so in this kinds of patients and uh, post mortem showed that uh, there is a lesion a damage in a part of the brain called broca's area so it looks it's somewhere here so and uh, what is interesting is the lesion is always almost always found in the left half of the brain same location but in the left side you see that this is the left side of the brain because this is the front of the brain and so that made broca kind of announce that uh, we speak with the left hemisphere our speech is controlled by the left hemisphere that was a major discovery this was like you know talking about late 19th century right uh, and that was a major discovery because that kind of a precise localization of brain function was not known before that then uh, complementary studies have been done by this other uh, you know physician uh, called karl wernicke so he found whereas broca's patients had trouble speaking they could understand but they had trouble speaking wernicke's patients uh, could speak but they could not understand and therefore they they could speak well uh, you know kind of garrulously and all but the the sentence that they produced did not have much much meaning right it was more gibberish so for example a, a wernicke patient would say something like this i called my mother on the television and uh, did not understand the door right it it was too breakfast but they came from far to near my mother is not too old for me to be young I mean, it's almost to me like rahul gandhi talking okay so just just joke i mean so uh, so they don't know what they are talking okay they just can kind of keep spewing, spewing out sentences which don't have much meaning so in case of wernicke's area the damage was here in broca's area it was here so this is a very precise localization and now we know that it was not it is not that precise localized for example wernicke's area is now understood as several like constellation of areas in this broad area but not it's not so precise localized but it's a very good start so similarly people have also found uh, that uh, There's another thing called conduction aphasia, right? Where in this condition, patients can understand words that they have heard uh, or seen, but they cannot repeat phrases. So they can speak on their own, right? They can understand something that is said to them, but they cannot repeat, uh, right? What is said to them? Uh, so in this case, and it, it so happens that the damage is not here, not here, but in a bunch of connections which connect the Wernicke's area to the Broca's area. Actually, those fibers are not shown in this picture. There's a bundle of fibers called arcuate fasciculus, which connects the Wernicke's area to Broca's area. In case of conduction aphasia, it is these fibers that are damaged, and that was discovered later. So, seeing all this, uh, Wernicke made a very nice summary because there's a long, long-standing problem of whether brain's function is localized or global, right? And uh, this was his summary. So, what he said is that brain mental functions, right, uh, are localized to single cortical regions and the interconnection between these functions make more complex intellectual functions possible so basically if we apply this kind of a kind of a synthesis to the to problem of speech on and language all right uh, language production that is speech production is done by the broca's area language understanding is done by wernicke's area and language repetition the what you if you want to repeat what you have if you hear something process it and Say something in response. For that, you need a connection between Wernicke's area and Broca's area. So basically, if you look at the broad problem of language or phenomenon of language, specific aspects of it are conducted by specific parts of the brain, but the overall process of language, the function of language, the language function, right, is conducted by a large network of areas in the brain, right, and these areas are all working in parallel, in a distributed fashion, all over the brain. so he coined the expression parallel and distributed processing which is a really beautiful summary i mean kind of, kind of you know, understanding you know considering that uh, this was done in the late 19th century because even though wernicke has made such a beautiful synthesis of ideas based on the data available at his, in his time uh, people kept on arguing about uh, this basic you know, understanding about brain for a long time until almost the 80s right when the same ideas were reproduced in mathematical models right and cast mathematical models and and that you know 
resulting in a lot of bad, you know, improved understanding. So now you see, see what's happening, right? In case of Carl Lashley, right? This guy was in search of what is called the n-gram. That is, where are memories stored in the brain? So uh, to understand, to study that, what did he do? Uh, he just made lesions or cuts. Actually, you know, uh, took a knife and cut, made cuts in the brain of animals. Uh, so rats are very good at uh, maze learning. So you might have heard of heard that you know, if you leave a rat in a maze, it will quickly learn the paths and find an escape route. Okay, so uh, so he studied rats as they were learning mazes, and then he made cuts on rats' brain. And what he found is uh, he wanted to know if uh, so different uh, uh, memories of different parts of the maze are located in different parts of the brain, right? Uh, so he made cuts in different places. And what he found in these studies is that the severity of learning deficit produced by the regions depended only on the extent of the damage, not on its precise location, right? So he actually uh, has drawn nice because I don't have that graph here, but he has drawn a nice graph of where x-axis is the total length of the cut and y-axis is the total deficit in its behavior, something like that. So it just there's an increasing you know, curve. Uh, longer the overall cuts and longer the and higher the deficit. Okay, so but again, now we know that the last year's experiments are also a bit crude. They're better than Florence experiment, Pierre Florence experiment, because this guy made like fine cuts, but even then, these cuts are made all over the brain, not in the exact locations where space is processed inside the brain, that is hippocampus. Had he made those cuts very precisely inside hippocampus, he would have found very precise deficits. Uh, but anyway, so these experiments also are quite crude. So based on these experiments, uh, Lashley had uh, made come up with two principles. The first is called equipotentiality, which says that all parts of the cortex or the surface of the brain is called a cortex, contribute equally to learning. So one part can substitute for another part. Okay, it's very similar to the aggregate field view, which was proposed by uh, Pierre Florence. The other idea is uh, called law of mass action. This has nothing to do with you know your uh, chemistry mass action, right? Uh, it says that the cortex works as a whole. Uh, performance improves when more of the cortex is involved. So this is again his conclusion. But so again, if you see, you see that there is a seesawing between uh, the localization guys and the globalization or whatever, the aggregate field view guys, people. So, uh, Penfield in Canada, right? This guy is a Canadian neurosurgeon. So he studied, uh, again, uh, brain, uh, brain function, but uh, using electrical simulation techniques. So what he, has, he was doing is, uh, he was doing actually surgeries for epilepsy. So epilepsy, as you know, we have discussed, right, consists of this kind of abnormal uh, brain activation involving synchronous activities spread over large parts of the brain. So usually this uh, kind of this kind of waves, synchronous waves start from one part of the brain called the epileptic focus. And uh, so, uh, and usually they, it's, it's not uh, interact, it's intractable. It, it doesn't yield to pharmaceutical, you know, it doesn't yield to drugs and there's no simple, there's no well uh, medication which works very well. It was at least in those days, this is the first half of the uh, 20th century. So what they were doing is the uh, isolate the part of the brain which is producing these abnormal waves and surgically cut it off. That's what they, they were doing. And uh, how do you find out which is the part of the brain which is producing these waves? Because this part of the brain looks normal like any other uh, brain area. It's only abnormal fun in functional terms, but in physical and anatomical terms, it's just the same. So the only way to locate that part is to electrically activate that part, that is pass some current by, put an, by putting an electrode, and see if that current triggers that those waves, right? So for that uh, process, for, you know, to do that, you need to be able to open the brain, expose the brain, and electrically activate different parts of the brain and search for this, what is called a, the epileptic focus. So while he was doing that, he was you know, also you know, inadvertently activating different parts of the brain, and he would study the patient's responses. Okay, and uh, so uh, he found in the process that if you activate uh, parts of the visual system, the occipital lobe, patients report that they are seeing flashes of light. Right, that means there's no real light. There's no real light. The eyes are closed. But if you activate uh, certain parts in the occipital lobe, the patients say that oh, I'm seeing flashes of light. 
Similarly, if you activate uh, another part of the brain uh, called the post central gyrus, right? If they feel that somebody is touching them. There's, there's nothing out there actually. Similarly, if you activate parts of the auditory cortex, right, in the superior uh, temporal lobe, they, they report that the hearing sounds, right? In fact, typically, if you activate temporal lobe areas, uh, they report uh, recalling the memories from very long ago. And uh, so all this, again, led to a very interesting understanding of uh, distribution of brain function. But again, you see that uh, here also it is supporting localization because there's a part of the brain where, where it produces visual experience, another part produces uh, somatic or touch experience, another part produces sound or auditory experiences. So it's very precisely localized. So Penfield work of brain mapping, again, seem to support this kind of a localization view. And more recent uh, studies on, you know, using functional imaging or you know, imaging studies, brain imaging studies, also supported localization view. So for example, if you look at this picture, right in the, in, so this is, a brain is put through a scanner and which tells you which part of the brain is active when the, when the subject is doing some kind of function, some kind of activity. So in this case, the subject is asked to look at text, look at view, uh, words, the passively uh, look at the words, don't read them aloud, but just look at them. So when they did that, the activity was found in the occipital part, which we now know that, uh, which is where the visual information is processed. Similarly, when they're listening to words, there's activity in the superior uh, temporal lobe, right, where you have auditory cortex, which process sounds, right, which is so natural. So when they are asked to speak out some words, they had activity in, you know, close to this, this is where the Broca's area is, that is activity there. And when they're generating verbs, again, they had activity in the, in the Broca's area and also uh, close to the Vedicus area. So this, this kind of experiments again, <coughs> confirm the idea that there is localization in the brain. So basically you can summarize it as follows. The brain is a network of modules and each module is a bunch of neurons. And these modules are connected, right, by some kind of wiring, the interconnections. These are the neural pathways. Right, a given function is mediated by a bunch of modules working together and cooperating through their interconnections. Okay, so now the question is, uh, how do you map behavior onto this component? So suppose you want to understand you know, how do people uh, perform visual function? The answer to that question should be, what are all the parts of the brain which work together to produce visual function? Right, uh, suppose uh, you are scanning an image, you know, to find something. You are looking for a city in a map, right? So then the question is, what are the parts of the brain which control your eye movements? What are the parts of the brain which will process the vision, the image, right? And then how do they work together? Okay, so this is how you need to explain brain function. So this kind of a view of uh, the brain is called a connectionist view, because in this kind of a view, right, you don't keep on asking which part of the brain does what, but you ask which parts of the brain, uh, right, are connected, uh, and are connected and work together to produce a given function. Okay, so, uh, when it comes to brain function, another area which has contributed a lot is, is uh, and to the neurophysiology, which is the neural function, is electrophysiology, right? The idea that uh, brain cells are made up of electricity, or there's a lot of electrical activity going on in uh, neurons. So the first, well, earliest work in that came with uh, Luigi, Luigi Galvani, right, who found that uh, muscles produce electricity. So he was studying muscles of, you know, uh, frogs, and one day by, you know, by mistake, he or his assistant touched the frog's uh, leg using a charged rod. And you know, you can produce charged rod, you know, using electrostatic methods, right? And he's found that the muscle twitched. So that was the starting point of the idea that, uh, so uh, living organisms have electricity inside them. So, uh, so much later in 19th and 20th centuries, you know, people have found that the neural signals are also made up of the special uh, voltage signals, electrical signals called action potentials. Then in 2024, 1924, Hans Berger uh, found a way of measuring brain's activity by putting electrodes on the surface of the head, on the skull, and that's called electroencephalogram. And much later, uh, these two British uh, neuro neuroscientists, Hodgkin and Huxley, 
have started taking recordings from uh, the nerve of a giant squid. A squid is a large animal, and therefore its nerves are also very thick, and uh, the nerve fibers are two millimeters thick. Normally, in our nerve fibers will be like about few microns in diameter, but whereas uh, squid nerve fibers are two millimeters thick, it was possible to penetrate these nerve fibers using the kind of somewhat thick electrodes that these guys, these people have uh, have worked with, right? And with these recordings, they found that uh, you know what is the molecular basis. Right uh, of the action potential. How is the action potential generated inside the nerve fiber? And that work uh, got them a Nobel Prize. And much later, people also have studied the effect of drugs on on the brain, on on, on nervous function. And uh, they also people have found that the signal that is transmitted from one neuron to another is in the form of a chemical. Right, and uh, so therefore the synaptic transmission is done by a chemical. And that was uh, first found by a very brilliant experiment by Otto Lewy. In this experiment, uh, so Lewy has taken two frog hearts, right? You know, you can keep a, a heart alive by putting it in a solution called the Ringer solution, right? So what they have done is uh, they have taken one heart. The heart has connected the nerve that controls the heart, the major nerve, is the vagus nerve. And if you activate this nerve, the the beating of the heart slows down. So that is well known. So they have taken a heart with the vagus nerve and put it in one beaker and activated the vagus nerve, and the heart slowed down. Then they have taken some fluid from the bath of the first beaker and transferred that fluid a little bit, the right bit of the fluid, to the second heart, which is in the second beaker. And they found that the second heart slowed down. So the thing is, normally to slow down a heart, you need to activate the vagus nerve. But here, the, for the second heart, there's no vagus nerve. In spite of that, the second heart slowed down. Which indicated that something from the fluid of the first beaker, right, uh, you know, came to the second heart. That is, when you activated the vagus nerve, something that was really that was acting on the heart to slow it down, also entered the fluid inside the beaker, and that was what uh, went to the second beaker and acted on the heart. And that must be only a chemical. So that was a major uh, proof that uh, the signal that is going from the nerve to the tissue here, to the muscle here. Is a chemical, and that was uh, turned out to be that turned out to be true later. And Otto Levy actually shared uh, a Nobel Prize uh, with uh, you know, Dale, who also did a lot of work on synaptic transmission. Then in psychology, again, a lot of work was done in the animal psychology, right? And uh, so there's uh, people started hard start studying animals in experimental conditions, in a very in rigorous conditions. They would basically treat animals as a black box. And you give input to the animal, and then it produces some output in terms of behavior, right? And uh, that gave rise to a whole field of study of psych on a branch of psychology called behaviorism. Uh, so one of the major uh, examples of these kinds of studies is the studies of uh, Ivan Pavlov in Russia with his dog. Uh, I'll and come to this later uh, and discuss in more detail. Right now, also the technology developments, right in the uh, last century, and also more and more technologies being developed, right in the in the recent uh, decades. Uh, so all this also gave rise to a lot of understanding of the brain, and uh, so mathematical modeling of the brain, which is the subject of this course, really picked up from the 80s. The earliest beginnings happened in the 40s, last century, but really it picked up in the from the 80s, and now it's really you know it is explosive growth of this field. So, so study of the brain means you know, study at multiple levels, right? At single neuron level, or at network of neurons level, or at systems level, or at level of whole behavior. Okay. So in this course, what we'll study is uh, we'll study basics of the brain for a couple of classes. Then we'll study some mathematical preliminaries, right? And then the whole course is divided into two parts: uh, models of single neuron and models of network networks. Okay. So. In the basics, we'll study this. This class is about introduction to neuroscience and our history of ideas. Then, in the next class, we'll study uh, basics of a neuron, and the class after we'll study basics of nervous system. And then, in the mathematical preliminaries, we'll we'll review linear algebra, but I won't. Uh, I'll just re record the video and uh, you know leave it uh, in the Moodle. You can watch it at your own convenience. But uh, in the live class, I'll do a class on dynamical systems. And limit cycle oscillators because in this uh, this time in this course I want to uh, spend a lot of time on oscillator models of neurons. Then I discuss an important model of neuron called the Hodgkin-Huxley model, 
and from there on i go to more detailed models of different parts of a neuron right this is the this style of modeling is called biophysical modeling so there we'll study uh, dendritic processing axonal processing and synaptic transcription then i kind of i climb down and look at more simpler models than hodgson huxley model and we have we discussed several models like which you know more models like uh, zikovich models so we progressively look at more and more uh, simple models right this is so here we climb up to more details and climb down to less details in the network models we discuss models of uh, oscillator networks uh, then we look at deep networks and then see what kind of uh, brain phenomena can be explained using deep networks right then look at how pulling networks and how they can be used to understand memories and then look at uh, self organizing maps we we'll also study systems a uh, little bit uh, visual system basal ganglia hippocampus then references uh, i'll be following my nptel notes mostly it's all available uh, and then uh, for the math part for the oscillator part especially i'll be following steven sogart's book on dynamical systems then for the biophysical modeling part i'll be following christoph cox's book called biophysics of computation then for the neural network part i'll be following satish kumar's textbook uh, then for neuroscience candlen schwartz and you can also look at uh, my book called the demystifying the brain the grading there will be probably three assignments uh, and one mid sem and one end sem right and uh, that's a totaling to 100 marks so thank you and uh, if you have any questions i can take them any questions hello you can unmute yourself and ask questions